Josiah has not broken the lock yet. 2,000 right there. Some would say he definitely deserved every single punch to the groin in that clip you just saw, but I think you'll have to watch the rest of this video to find out why. This man emerged as an intriguing UFC fighter, showcasing a diverse skill set that encompassed striking techniques, grappling maneuvers, and a relentless competitive spirit. But as you just saw, and in addition to his involvement in mixed martial arts, he had a somewhat notable acting career. He also had his run in Hollywood earning many roles in B-films, but he is best known for his role as Random Task in the 1997 film Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. However, this B-list actor and former MMA fighter who has worked with the likes of Mark Harmon, Vern Troyer, and Michael Myers has committed sinister crimes that will see him behind bars for a very, very long time. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Narratives. First and foremost, I want to apologize for lax uploading schedule lately. For the next 7 months, I'm going to try to pursue making at least one upload each week. On this channel, we go over a lot of true crime and dark stories. If these topics pique your interest, you may want to subscribe to this channel. Without further ado, let us begin. Today's case will briefly but broadly take us all over the planet, mostly to Asia and America. If you are a 90s kid, then there is a good chance that you have had a chance to watch the Austin Powers trilogy from 1997 to 2003. Being a young teenager in those years myself, I thought that all three of the films provided quality comedy content, although looking back, some of the innuendos and laughing points could be regarded as cheap laughs by today's standards. For those of you who don't know, the trilogy, which was starred in by Michael Myers playing as both the main villain and the main character, was essentially full of knockoff characters that were pulled from the James Bond franchise. As an example, there was of course the character Goldmember in the final of the three films, who was the comedy action franchise's adaptation of Goldfinger, Basil Exposition, the comedy adaptation of Q, and plenty of other examples that you can find throughout the franchise. If blatantly cheesy comedy sounds like something you'd like to watch, then you'll enjoy the Austin Powers franchise for its memorable one-liners and unique sense of Michael Myers' humor. However, for today's case, we're going to be focusing on one actor in particular who committed a horrendous crime that went without prosecution for over a decade. Joe Sun, known best for his minor role in the Austin Powers series as Random Task, a knockoff of the character Oddjob from the James Bond franchise. We can guesstimate that for this role he earned anywhere from a few thousand dollars to low five figures. However, in the 1990s he did earn major roles in minor films. He landed a role as one of the bad guys in the first Shoot Fighter film, and in Shoot Fighter 2 he was the main villain. And this is where I need your help. I tried searching for this information, but none of it is available online from what I was looking for. If you guys can find the box office ticket sales for Shoot Fighter and Shoot Fighter 2, we might be able to get an idea of how much Joe Sun profited from his roles in these films. If one of you has access to this information, leave a comment and I'll pin your comment below this video. All things considered, Mr. Sun had a career in MMA and training fighters, acting as a corner man or coach in UFC, attempting to become an MMA fighter and kickboxer himself, and more. Unfortunately, not once in his career in the martial arts industry did he take a single victory. Some of these fights can be found on YouTube, but not all of them can be. The first fight that he took was against Keith Hackney, where he took several punches to the groin, and then was grappled into submission, forcing him to tap out 2 minutes and 58 seconds into the first round. His second fight was only 33 seconds long, losing to Yusuke Imamura with a severe elbow injury. His third match was up against Joe Moreira in April 2002, where he lost to Moreira in the first round after being forced into submission yet again. His final fight was against the Japanese national, Juke Nakajima, whom he lost to 58 seconds after the first round began. He also had an attempt to go at kickboxing in July of 1995, but lost to Nobukai Kakuda 1 minute and 40 seconds after the round began. It is safe to say that throughout the 90s, Joe Hyunming Sun had a diverse set of roles in the entertainment industry, whether it be fighting, kickboxing, wrestling, mixed martial arts, or acting in various films in general. 
all of this is meant to say that for a first generation immigrant born in Gwangju, South Korea, he was making a decent name for himself in America, the land of opportunity. His parents could proudly look at him and say, my son is working in the Hollywood film industry and when he's not doing that, he's working in the fighting sports industry. He's been on TV as a fighter and he's been on TV as a coach of other fighters and wrestlers. However, one day in 2008, he and his roommate at the time got into a spat, resulting in Joe kicking in the passenger door of his roommate's car. For that, he was arrested and charged with a single count of felony vandalism. Then, the officers who arrested him collected a DNA sample from him and ran it through their database. Then you said that you were uh, an actor. What do you do with acting? Um, I do comedy, play bad guys sometimes. Do you see Austin Powers? Uh -huh. Um, I played a little role in part one. Okay. What else did you do? You just act? Is that um, what you do? Maybe just acting and... I, I'm a professional fighter. What kind of fighter? MMA. You can find me on Wikipedia, believe it or not. How did you do your fighting career? I lost all my fights. I was in UFC 4. I did a Pride um, 2002, February and July. I lost mm -hmm. both fights. I pro wrestled there for a little while. Um, it was going good, but I didn't sign the contract. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, now let me tell you what the deal is here, okay? Again, girl, 19 years old. You know, late at night, early morning, it was just evening, 24 December 1990. Driving home to the legal apartment complex is on Burgers. Okay? She parks in the carport. Two guys jam her in the carport. They grab her, throw her in the car, drive her some distance away. That's bad. It's very bad. And the DNA tells us it's you. Okay, wrong guy. Do you recognize anybody in that? That's you, right? That's me. Uh, and what we did, showed that to the girl who's kidnapped. She goes, 100% certain Sam, I've seen that face every night I go to bed. She said, that's the face I've seen of the guy who kidnapped me, one of the guys who kidnapped me and raped me. I mean, just that alone screws you, okay? No doubt about it. Okay, and the DNA is saying, yes, you're the guy. And you're sitting here saying, how is that going to fly, Joe? This is scary. You know, I can't tell you something I don't know. Well, why do you do know? Is it and and you, 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 know, you say you have this evidence, you know, mm -hmm. and it's scary. Mm -hmm. Then you said that you were uh, an actor. What do you do with acting? Um, I do comedy, okay. play bad guys sometimes. Do you see Austin Powers? Uh -huh. Um, I played a little role in part one. Okay. The victim, known as Jane Doe, was interviewed on camera using a different alias on 48 Hours. She stated that she was pistol whipped several times, tortured, violated with DNA samples left on her body, and in her own words, left for dead. During this process taking place, she had pleaded for her life by lying and telling both of the men carrying out these heinous crimes that she had a child and needed to take care of him. The incident, according to her testimony, lasted hours. Each of her two kidnappers inflicted multiple assaults on her and had used their firearms to commit lewd acts on her. She was left with a semi-dislocated shoulder, a dislocated section of her jaw, half of her teeth were loose in her mouth due to how violently she was pistol whipped multiple times, and her hair was being held in place by pieces of dried blood on her scalp. When she had time to go home and take a shower, in her own words, maybe half of it had fallen out. Throughout the entire ordeal, Joe Sun was the one calling the shots and was adamant that she tell him where the closest cliffs were so that he could throw her off when they were finished with her. His accomplice in this crime was not so adamant about doing this. He covered her in a jacket and insisted that they leave her alone. By the time her suspects were arrested, she was in complete shock and dismay, remarking that the main suspect was in her living room, sitting inside a DVD case. The crime, as you all know, took place on Christmas Eve of 1990. The accomplice that Joe's son had was Santiago Gaitan. He was sentenced to 17 years in 2011 and was eligible for parole as early as 2018. The mastermind of this crime, Joseph Hyunming Sun, was originally charged with five counts of RAPE, two counts of forcible sodomy, two felony counts of sodomy in concert by force, seven felony counts of forcible oral copulation and one felony count of penetration by a foreign object by force. If convicted, he was looking at a very 
very, very long time behind bars. However, in a very sick and sad plot twist, the statute of limitations for each of these crimes that he had charged with was already passed. Joe's son couldn't be convicted of any of those crimes that we just mentioned. However, prosecutors were able to charge him with torture, kidnapping, and conspiracy to commit murder. In August of 2011, he was found guilty of one felony count of torture and was sentenced to anywhere from seven years to life in prison. About 30 days into serving his sentence, he was given a roommate named Michael Thomas Graham, who was sentenced to two years in prison for failing to register on the sex offenders list in Orange County. After exhausting all avenues available, I was not able to find out what his original offense was, and if you guys can find that information and then post it in the comments below, I will be extremely grateful. Speculation permits that he may have committed an inappropriate offense to a child, because Joe took it upon himself to beat him to death in his cell in less than 25 minutes. For this, he was sentenced to 27 years more, meaning that he won't be getting out anytime soon. There's a few questions we want to ask ourselves about why Joe committed the crimes that he committed both the murder of his cellmate while he was serving time in prison and the reason why he committed his acts of sexual violence in 1990. It isn't uncommon for criminals to serve only two-thirds of their sentence before release, meaning that potentially Joe might have been able to get out of the slammer in as little as four or five years if he simply served his time and had good behavior. Instead, he murdered his cellmate and this could have also been for any speculative number of reasons. Joe could have been told, kill him or we kill you by whatever gang he had joined. He may have given up on the prospect of ever leaving prison. He may have been bipolar and easily angered. Or maybe Graham talked too much about the sickening crimes that he committed. Sex offenders are easy targets in prison. This is pure speculation, but a real possibility. Steroid abuse. There is one other UFC fighter I can think of by the name of War Machine who abused steroids and then went on an extremely violent crime spree. However, given Sun's history of dormancy and violent crimes, I cannot say with certainty whether or not he did. If anyone watching is more familiar with this topic, feel free to comment below. Putting all of his time together before he might be eligible for parole, that is a grand total of 34 years. This concludes today's case. If you thought today's video was interesting, and if you like the idea of justice always being served, no matter how long a victim needs to wait, please hit the like button. If you think you'll be back, consider watching some of my other videos, and then consider subscribing. As always, remember that every day is a new opportunity to see the light, and until next time, I bid you all farewell.